Amen. Well, uh, good morning, family. It's awesome to uh, be able to worship God this morning. Um, it's amazing uh, a service so far. I just want to give a special shout out to uh, Lisa doing an incredible job, uh, reminding us all what the cross means to her and um, reminding us really what this is all about in terms of worship. It's, it's about Jesus on the cross. Amen. Um, I want to give a shout out to Paul Hammond as well, doing an incredible job, uh, reminding us the call of the hour right now is to, uh, to knock out our special missions. You know, we have a, a, a nice, great goal of $67,385 as a region, and I know the God we serve, we're going to totally knock it out the park. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, uh, you know, today's service, uh, our theme is uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, anyone excited for uh, Thanksgiving this uh, week? Hey, Amen. Uh, I feel like personally we're in the, we're in the best region uh, to, to have this, uh, this holiday. I mean, I know a lot of people are going to be uh, cooking some great meals. Uh, I'm going to make my rounds a little bit, you know. I'm going to go to people's house, get some mac and cheese. Uh, whoever got some turkey that's not dry, I'm going to be there. <laughs> nah, but it's going to be incredible. Make sure you... Uh, you, you you know, you uh, open up your doors because I will be calling you. Amen. Uh, let's get into our Bibles. Um, I hope you guys are excited to get into the Word of God this morning. Amen. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5 verse 4 says, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Yeah. Ephesians 5 verse 19 through 20 it says, Speak it to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. That's some amazing singing that we just heard. Amen. But then it says, Always giving Thanks to God the Father for everything. The Bible calls us to be thankful in every circumstance of our lives. However, being thankful, it is a choice. It's a choice. You could choose to be thankful or you could choose not to be thankful. And what very, very fitting way that this week is Thanksgiving week, amen? And there's so much to really be grateful for. I mean, the fact that we get to worship God here this morning is something to be fired up about, amen, church. You know, the title of my lesson today is thankfulness. Thankfulness. I think oftentimes we just need to be reminded of really what's important in life. There's so many scriptures that talks about being full of the Spirit and keeping a step with the Spirit and having fruits of the Spirit. And today we're going to look at some scriptures of what it looks like when someone is walking with God and thankful to God. Today we're going to look at what type of response, if someone's actually walking with God, what should their lifestyle be if they're truly thankful? Amen. Point number one, when you're thankful to God, you praise God. Let's go over to our text in Luke 17. When you're thankful to God, you praise God. And what better way to learn how to be thankful than learn from the most thankful Man himself, Jesus. If we look at it, the day in life of Jesus, we're going to pick it up here in Luke 17. Say amen when you get there. Amen. And in verse 11, we pick it up. And it says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went on, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked them. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleans? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. And the church said, Amen. when you're thankful to God, you praise God. 
Here we see Jesus just traveling along the road, and it says in the scriptures, it was between the border of Samaria and Galilee. Now, we all kind of know this. Obviously, one region was full of just uh, Samaritans, and the other were just full of uh, Jews. And they were Israelites. And during this time period, in terms of their association, they would not be close to one another. It was like this sense of uh, disgust amongst each other. The Samaritans didn't like the Israelites, and the Israelites didn't like the Samaritans. And I think in a today's time, we have groups that have the same mindset. That person don't like this one, but I don't like them. Let's get into our text. Here we see two groups, and yet ten had leprosy, but only one comes back. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but let's kind of focus a little bit. Here we see that, okay, they have leprosy. Leprosy was this skin disease. Right? And the skin disease, pretty much it was so bad that the, the fact of the matter that they had to outcast, out, out, outcast themselves and become isolated. So they had to remove themselves from the camp and be outside the camp because people were afraid that, hey, it was contagious in a way. And sadly, physically speaking, the leprosy would just break down their skin. And so their skin just started kind of oozing and falling apart over time. And it started eating away at their flesh. Very nasty, Right? Even getting a graphic of that, very nasty. You know, the crazy thing that does the same thing spiritually is sin. And so, physically speaking, yes, leprosy, but the spiritual aspect of leprosy was just sin. And sin has the same effect in people's lives in a spiritual aspect that it eats away at you spiritually. And it eats away at you. And it eats away at you to the point where you're so outcast and isolated that you can't even be family. Then we see here that these ten lepers are begging Jesus for mercy. They're like, have mercy on this son of God. Have mercy on us. And what was mercy? It's just a compassion or forgiveness towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Here's the thing. God has every right to not do the things he does and be justified for it. But yet in his mercy, he gives you life. In his mercy, he gives you more and more and more and more. And the fact of the matter is, the crazy thing, it was 10 leprous men. And so we know, like, in the Bible, numbers can represent a lot of things, right? Seven is perfection, but 10 was to represent the completeness of order. God gave Moses the 10 commandments on the mountain. The 10 plagues to help free the Israelites from Egypt representing complete judgment on that empire during that time. And so here... These guys showed themselves to the priest because Jesus said, hey, go show yourself to the priest. Now, Mosaic law, Levitical law, at the time, the priest had authority. Yes, they were set apart from God to do the work in the tabernacle or the temple. However, they also had the opportunity to determine whether someone was clean or unclean inside the temple. And so Jesus said, hey, go show yourselves to the priest so that they can determine whether you're clean or unclean. And we see, obviously, they come back clean. But only one shows up at Jesus' feet. And the Bible would define that there's only one guy on this narrow road is the only one that's thankful. He's so thankful. What was his response? The fact of the matter that he was given mercy from God himself. He praised God. Ain't that true? When you're grateful and someone's doing something that you really don't deserve, only thing that maybe you can offer back in return is a thank you. You see, for the scriptures, our gratitude is a direct correlation to our praise and worship to God. And so if you're upset and you're ticked off and you're not fired up, it's it's only one reason. Why are you grateful? And I got to ask this today. Are you thankful? Today, the fact that you get to live and see another day. We can take these things for granted. You know, out of all the people on this earth, and there's billions of people, those who call themselves Christians should be the most fired up individuals in the whole world. In the whole world. Someone should be able to walk into a room and see Christians like, man, this... This group is different, like Lisa said. Why? Because they're so thankful. They're so grateful. Their lives are so different. And and there's evidence behind that because of their lifestyle. 
because of the choices they make. Not even in the church, even outside the church, their lives are no different. It's all lined up with the scriptures, whether they're in their workplace, in school, it doesn't matter. Their lifestyle should be so different and so a contrast from the world because they're thankful. You know, I just think about my life because sometimes we can forget and just really forget really where we came from. Just a little bit about myself. Um, obviously, born and raised in San Francisco. Most of the time when people think about San Francisco, you think about the Golden Gate Bridge, right? <laughs> you think about Alcatraz and all these amazing landmarks, and that's true. But it's, it's like any city, it has this, it's hidden parts that most people don't, there's not the most tourist area, right? And so for myself, I grew up in public housing. And I grew up in, a, in an area where there's a lot of gang violence. You know, for me, what it did, growing up as a young man of color, it created a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. Just unneeded, like, stress, to be honest. And I just remember, like, wow, I remember just living my life so young, wondering, would I ever see the age of 18? Because... Other teens around my age, whether they were affiliated with things or not, sadly were just losing their lives just because of nonsense. You know, I remember coming from football practice and I seen my cousin pretty much just fighting for his life because he was gunned down with the AK-47 assault rifle. Leave practice, get a phone call, we go up to the scene, my mom, my other family members, and he's literally on the floor fighting for his life. And it's easy to tap out of those things from where you just once came from. But it didn't stop there. I remember as a kid just innocently running around in the, in the playground, the ball going to the street. I ran to the street, get hit by a car. As I got older, I got in multiple car accidents to the point where I even shouldn't be here to this day. Car hit the rail and I spin out of control and a truck go by and I didn't even see the truck. But I was so out of tune and out of touch with my life. Only thing I could focus on, like, man, I got to pay for this guy's car. But yet, I should have been grateful to the fact that I was still alive. Even as a kid, going, being able to go to the store, you can't even go innocently to the store with your friends without like dodging bullets. All throughout that, God has protected me numerous of times. Like, I should be dead, honestly. But then having the blessings of God as well, being able to graduate high school on time. To go to UC Berkeley and graduate on time as a student athlete with the over 3.0 GPA. To be able to work in my career in the San Francisco Financial District to do the things that I love to do, but yet, it was just a tad piece of success. It was just a tad piece of happiness. It was just a tad piece of fulfillment. Until I started studying the Bible. I started studying the Bible. God determined the time and place as I was in a fraternity. One of my frat brothers actually reached out to me. I started studying the Bible, learned what it means to actually have true faith, repented, and got baptized on May 13, 2015. And the crazy thing, my life since then, man, has been a life of just fulfillment, a life just full of joy, and it's easy to forget that. I have an incredible wife, a credible daughter, they're healthy. I'm living my dream to serve God and serve his people. I wouldn't have it no any other way, honestly. But I, I share this because sometimes we could be out of touch with this reality. We could be out of touch with the, the blessings that God is constantly pouring in the day in and day out in our lives. You know how I know? Because I could also be out of touch of it. You get so caught up in the busyness of life and all these different things, got this, got this, got to, got to get the kids here, got, got to get kids out of school, and, and I got work in here, and all these different things that goes on that really doesn't matter at the end of the day. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Only thing that matters is you, your relationship with God, heaven, the loss, the cross. That's all that matters. But you often be just be faked out and out of tune, just like the nine lepers. We don't even stop and just, just, just pause for a second because we live in a world that's so fast-paced. Next thing after the next thing after the next thing. And once you get that, it's not enough. You go to the next thing because you're not truly fulfilled. And sadly, we could even be like that in the church where we should be fired up that we have a relationship with God. Are you with me? Here's the thing we got to get a conviction on. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. We act like we're doing God's service. I mean, doing God a service by showing up. You see what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is you get to show up. 
It should mean everything. It should create a catharsis in your heart like, man, I deserve death. Just like the, as, 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 as much as the person to my right and left. We're no better. But the fact that matter that you get to be here, man, it should bring you like a lot of joy and a lot of praise to God. But honestly, like we don't, we don't, we don't have that here at Southland oftentimes. Because I think sometimes we get like so caught up in like what the other person and how they're looking at you. <laughs> we could get so like, oh man, if I worship this way, like would it feel weird? No. You worshiping your God. <laughs> Give your heart. <laughs> we gotta understand, even Jesus himself was thankful. He broke bread oftentimes throughout the scriptures. And so I just want to challenge this. And I, it's funny because I, I think I challenged this with this before, but I, I want to challenge this again because it's easy to forget. I want to challenge to write 10 things you're grateful for. You know, here's some practicals. Keep a gratitude journal. Simple. You know, in this gratitude journal, just establish a daily practice where you just set aside some time to just constantly write down the things that you're grateful for. Remember the bad even at times as a practical. In order for you to truly understand how good you got it now, sometimes you got to think about your life before you got right with God and see how God had to pull you far from so much mess so you could truly be grateful for where you at now. Have prayers of gratitude. I think sometimes we pray so much about the things we want, but we need to also pray about the things we're grateful for and thankful for around us. We need to have a practical of just coming to our senses, the fact that you get the feel, taste, touch, things that we often take for granted all the time. It makes you human. Be grateful for it. Another practical, use visual reminders. Why? Because we forget. We're like sheep. <laughs> and so sometimes the visual reminders just help just trigger thoughts of gratitude. And oftentimes we move so fast we forget to just look at the visual or reminders around us, each other. <laughs> the fact that we get to be full of a room with people who love God, who want to do right by people, who want to get to heaven, like, there's things that we should be grateful for. We also need to be grateful for, like, another practice is just watching our language. You may wonder, like, what, what do you mean by this? Well, grateful people oftentimes not just talk about themselves, but they're talking about those who've made a difference in their lives. They're lifting up others. They're encouraging others. Why? Because they're truly grateful. Let us be a grateful church, not only being thankful to God, but also praise the God. Amen? Point number two, when you're thankful to God, you work hard for God. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Is this church still awake this morning? Amen. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's get, let's get thankful, amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 2, it says, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll pause here. When you're thankful to God, you work hard for God. You know, the Bible says the church here in Thessalonica, it says that they worked hard. They're labored. Why? Because they loved. They endured so much because they had hope. And here, in Acts 17, this is where the church actually got started. Paul was persecuted, and he's writing all these different letters to the church here in Thessalonica, and the church by this time is known for their hard work. It's awesome. It's an encouraging thing to be known by something that's of like a value of that because you're so thankful to God. But sometimes in order for us to work super hard, sometimes we got to kind of dial it on back and just remember where we came from. Amen. Let's look at Acts 17. Let's look at how this church actually got started and all the opposition they actually have to go through. Look at Acts 17. You know, when you're thankful to God, you work hard for God. In Acts 17, we pick it up here in verse 1. <clears throat> Say amen when you get there. In verse 1, it says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Then this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. 
Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Amen for the sisters right there. Amen. <laughs> Verse 5, it says, but other Jews were jealous. Oops. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find him, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. As soon as, it, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those at Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews at Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, some of them went there too. Agitating the crowds and staring them up, the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left him with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Let's pause here. What just happened? Here we see Paul preaching and spreading the gospel all around the known world at the time. And this is really how the church in uh, Thessalonica got started. Paul was preaching the message of Christ. Some people got agitated and roughed some feathers up because the truth, it disturbs the comfort and comforts the disturbed. And we see some actually got saved from this. And that very few, also known as what, remnant? Remnant is just a, 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 just a few of faithful people still there. From this small group of people, the gospel continued to spread in Thessalonica in which you get the church from. But in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all this hardship and this opposition, the crazy part, not just from those who didn't believe in the message at first, like the Greeks, but sadly even amongst his own countrymen, the Jewish nation at this time. So Paul's getting the opposition from those outside as those within. But yet he's working so hard. Why? Because Paul is so thankful to God for a second chance at life. We know this to be the case because all of most of the Paul's writings, he's always talking about being in touch with the grace of God. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, God's grace was without effect in Paul's life and it caused him to work harder than those around him. And Paul understood this. He was given a second chance, a third chance, and oftentimes for many of us, we're given more than one chance. We're given multiple chances. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. You're kind of given like a lot of chances. <laughs> a lot, a lot of chances. But we can't forget, like, this is how the church got started. Through hard work. It got built up through hard work. It was fruitful labor for Paul. And the church later became, that we know in 1 Thessalonians 1.8, it talks about how this church became imitators of Paul. What did they imitate? His work ethic. Well, the gospel at the time, it was known everywhere because of their faith. Why? Because they were truly thankful. But one may ask, well, that's awesome. That is awesome, bro. They worked hard, they were thankful, but what does it actually look like when someone loses sight of that? What happens when they lose sight when, when, when they're no longer thankful to God? What happens when they, when they, when they get out of touch and they like, unplug themselves from being part of the body, truly immersed into the kingdom? Well, you find yourself in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go there. I mean, that's why it's two letters, right? 1 yeah. Thessalonians, known for hard work. Let's see how this church ends in 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 3, verse 6. It says, in, a, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. And does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. What was this example? Working hard. I don't when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's food without paying for it. 
On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn their food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey your instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Man, it went, it went, it went, it went from zero to 100 real quick, right? What happened? The people became idle. They just stopped working for the Lord. And here's the thing. Paul... Who's the, who's the leader? He rebukes them for their laziness and idleness. And so we see from the scriptures, when we're truly thankful, when we're calling ourselves Christians, the same as being a disciple, not only are you a Christian, you're a disciple, and you're saved, but guess what? You're a worker, a flat-out worker because you're in touch with the grace of God. You have a fruitful labor, whatever it is. You're sharing your faith. You're, you're, you're being an example. You're being, a, you're being a model of those because you're modeling the, the example of Christ. You're building up the church, not tearing it down. You're serving. You're pouring yourselves out. However, on the opposite side, when you're ungrateful, when you're not thankful, the Bible says that you're lazy. You know, today is, is Thanksgiving Special Mission Sunday. And I'm fired up about it. <laughs> I'm fired up. Because I really believe the saints here in Southland gave their best. Yes. Worked super hard night and day, not being a burden to anyone. And we're going to see this great victory. And because of this, just like Paul mentioned earlier, we're going to see 28 churches get planted this year. Yeah. It's totally God. Why? Because of you guys' work ethic. Because you guys are laboring day in and day out, working super hard. But you know what that does? When you give, and you give sacrificially, guess what? We have opportunity to plant churches. And so you know what their response is? They're thankful. Because of your sacrificial giving. And you know what that causes and stirs up in them? That they too want to work hard. Why? Because they're grateful. And so I just want to share some good news a little bit from our sister churches around the world that just got planted this year. So the Oklahoma City Church that just got planted not too long ago, right? Nate and Sam Pavone, just three months ago at the GLC, at the inaugural service on September 18th of this year, they're already at over 13 baptisms. Why? Because they're working super hard, and they are very thankful. I think about our church that just got planted this year in Naja, Philippines. That it went from 12 disciples now, it's sitting over 40 disciples. Just this year, it just got planted. Why? Because they've been working super hard, and they're thankful for your giving. Our sister church in Warsaw, Poland. I mean, we all know the, the war that's going on in Ukraine, in Russia. And so God would have us the year of the Spirit. This is our theme this year. God's Spirit blows wherever it pleases. And man, God put it on our heart, put it as another prayer goal to plant a church in Warsaw, Poland. Well, since that planning, they've been seeing a lot of Bible studies, and they've been having a lot of baptisms. I mean, just our dear sister, Sandra Smith, who was just in the West region, uprooted herself to go over there to Warsaw to build up the church. And it's awesome because of their fruitful labor. Now they got a sister's household. Now the church went from 17 disciples to now having more. And not just that, this past Sunday just had one-for-one -one visitors. Amen? That's a good thing. Why? Because they're working super hard in the Lord because they're thankful. You know, for us, I want to remind us to continue to work hard for the Lord because you're thankful. Like, why are you here at church? It's a good question. Why are you here? You could be doing anything with your Sunday. If you love sports, you could be watching NFL right now. I miss the holidays. You could be, like, standing in line getting that turkey right now before... It's sold out. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Because I believe the men and women in this room understand what it truly means to be thankful. And for that, you guys are working hard. That's why you, you guys are kind of at a low a little bit. And it's either people are at a low because they're in sin or they're at a low because they've been working super hard. You just sold out. You just sold out. Right? But here I'm going to put before this too. As a region weeks ago, I really want to commend the church because we've been working super hard. All of our ministries, the teens have Bible studies, the campus have Bible studies, the singles have Bible studies, our women of wisdom have Bible studies, the Marys have Bible studies. Like, because everyone was working. It wasn't just, oh, the evangelist or the, the leader doing all the work. No, every single disciple was working. Every single disciple was just fighting for Bible studies. Every single disciple was fighting to get visitors to church. You know, as a region, a lot of us noticed we had a prayer go to have at least 30 ongoing Bible studies on a weekly basis, right? Just to kind of kick it off, right? God could do more. And the crazy thing, God did do more during that time, right? We was average like over 40 Bible studies. And every ministry had Bible studies. The cool thing about that, just to let you know that amount of potential that Southland has, it was not really the biggest region right now. However, it was like number two in terms of total Bible studies leading in the L.A. church for like weeks. Why? Because you guys, hard work. But over the last couple of weeks, and a lot of it because I, I'll take the blame as the leader, I think we start getting focused on the transitions, getting focused on missions, and what happened, the no, number of studies kind of start to trickle down. You know? But I want to call us to get back on a horse, like, amen, when we get this victory today, the next day is a new day, right? Let's get back to working hard for the Lord. Let's get back to, like, it's the, it's the perfect time. It's the time of the holidays. What better way to, like, now start spending time with your families, sharing the good news with your families. You got friends coming from visiting from afar, been in town. Share the gospel with them now. You know, I want to challenge us to have fruitful labor. This week, let's try to set up one new Bible study. Just one. We can do that. Just one. Just one. Right? And fruitful labor by getting in each other's lives encouraging each other, spurring each other on so we can continue to mature and grow in our walk with God. Are you with me, church? Point number three. When you are thankful to God, you store up your treasures in heaven. When you are thankful to God, you store up your treasures in heaven. Look at Matthew chapter 6. You know, Matthew chapter 6 uh, is also known, part of it is just uh, the Beatitudes. It was Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And a lot of the teachings right here, Jesus just really just teaching the people really what it means to be a Christian. He's hitting on a lot of different things like, hey, don't pay back evil for evil. Learn to forgive those who wronged you. Uh, you're the light of the world. He started talking about prayer, which is a very essential to your walk with God, your times with God, right? He started talking about fasting. It's very essential to your walk with God. But he also talks about giving. And so I know Paul asked me earlier, we're going to talk about giving. But honestly, I can't help I can't help it. I'm going to talk about giving. Amen? Look at Matthew chapter 6. Let me pick it up here in verse 19. Verse 19, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moss and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Drop down to verse 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Oftentimes, Jesus is talking a lot about the kingdom, but he's also talking a lot about money. Why? Because as Americans, <laughs> we're American. And as Americans, we love the power of money. It's a great resource. You can do things. It's a security. Uh, it's a comfort there. And God tells us, hey, where your treasure is, dear, your heart will be also. And he's teaching this and reminding the people, hey, really, where's your investment at, man? Where's your investment at? Is it in the world or is it truly inside the kingdom of God? Let's go over to Luke chapter 12. I love this parallel passage to this. Because when you're not thankful, your investments can be in other places. Luke chapter 12 In verse 32, say amen when you get there. 
Awesome. In verse 32 it says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that would never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The same teachings, but I love the parallel passage here because we also see that Jesus said, he's pleased to give you the kingdom. God wants you to be a part of the kingdom. God wants you to have a relationship with him so you can be with him for eternity in heaven. But if you're not invested in the kingdom here on earth, you're not invested in it in heaven. Where your treasure is, dear, your heart will be also. And so a lot of us want the benefits of Christianity, the lifestyle of Christianity, the blessings like, oh, I want to be married too. I, 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 wanna, I want that nice car. I want, the, I want the joy. I want the joy Lisa was talking about. We want the benefits of it, but none of us want the death. Jesus says, hey, sell your possessions. You got things? Give it up, dude. You got money? Give it up. Where your treasure is. If it's that difficult, then it tells you where your treasure is. It shows you where you value the most. Let's look at an example of a guy who wasn't willing to store up things in heaven. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we pick it up here in verse 17, the, the story of the rich young ruler. And in verse 17 it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his feet, uh, knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a great question. Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You should not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Amen, teens? Amen, everybody right there. Uh. Amen. Verse 20, it says, teacher, he declared, all these I have when I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. We'll pause here. Here we see this guy ask this, this, the most profound question that a lot of us at some point wanted to know, and maybe for some of us in this room want to know. How do I get right with God? What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? Great question. Jesus answers him. No one's good except God alone. And he starts to tell him, hey, these are the things what, what you need to do. The guy's like, okay, I did these since I was a boy. So we could tell this guy was very religious. However, Jesus, who knows all things, just because people appear to be religious doesn't mean they don't have sin. <laughs> you follow me? And Jesus like, dude, you lack one thing. It, it looks nice. You dressed up. It looks nice. But you lack one thing still. And it's interesting that Jesus says you lack one thing, but tells him to do like several things. Right? He says, one, go sell everything you have. He had to give everything up. It's a cost, right? Give to the poor. Hey, some, some repentance here. Serve. Maybe he was rich because he was greedy. Three, then come follow me. Jesus could have made it easy on this guy. He's like, great question. Come follow me. Let's go. No, 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 no. Jesus, I do. It's a cost. It's a death to Christianity. You actually got to carry your cross. And by carrying it, do you actually have true life? And this guy walks away sad. But oftentimes we forget, like a lot of us, like we want to blame Jesus. Like, like Jesus, what are, you, like, what are you doing, man? Like, Jesus loved them. He loved them enough and put the relationship on the line to tell them the honest, blunt truth. You lack one thing. And we all got that one thing we go lack. <laughs> and Jesus tells them, hey, this is what you need to do. Then come follow me. And it's crazy 
that this guy walks away sad. But it makes me think, like, this guy never gave up anything. He still had all of his wealth. He still had everything that he held on to. Why is he so sad? Why is this guy so sad? You know, it's crazy because the things we think or assume that's going to make us happy actually don't make us happy. That relationship you're holding on to, you think that's going to make you happy? It's not really going to make you happy. The fellowship that you're holding on to, because we all grew up religious to a degree, but if they're not truly living out the Bible, and we think because it's the relationships that's going to keep us there to make us happy, but if you're not living it out, it's not really going to make us happy. The truly only thing that can only make us happy is us really following Jesus, and that comes with the cost of storing your treasures in heaven. You know, I want to lift up the Southland region, honestly, because I believe with all my heart this region stores up their treasures in heaven. Yeah. Honestly, I got to lift up a couple of people, honestly. Um, Eddie and Lori, hitting their special missions goal by fundraising and asking for family and friends, even their coworkers, and they gave way more than expected. I want to lift up the McCarthy's, you know, gave out of their personal finances and even like Gave up and beyond that, even by the fundraising and the walkathons. I want to lift up our dear sister, Takoya, who don't even have a job. Who don't even have a, a, a job because she's a full-time student, but yet got creative in her fundraising and started making these amazing mini cakes. And she blew out her special missions by the hundreds. And not just that, had the heart to not just blow it out for ourselves, but start to help other people. Like, hey, how can I help you as well? I want to lift up our dear sister, Janae. You know, Janae, as some of you guys know in the, in the chat, I think she was sharing that she had car issues that this uh, past long ago. However, she didn't let it stop there. She's like, you know what? I still got to hit my missions. And so she got really creative. She started problem solving. She overcame evil with good. And for that, man, she should be commended. She was braiding hair, bunching in a bunch of her appointments, braiding hair. She's like sleep deprived here. But she's fired up for God, amen? I got to lift up the Women of Wisdom ministry as well. You know, the majority of the women are all on fixed income. But they didn't stop them from giving their best to God. A lot of them, like, to Paul's point, a lot of them, to Paul's point, is like, okay, just like the scripture in Exodus, just, just stop them from giving. Well, we try to do that with the Women of Wisdom, but they just keep on giving. <laughs> they just keep on giving. I got to lift up our dear brother Moses Cooley. For the, the past three days, uh, he's just been, like, really surviving just off four hours of sleep. Driving Lyft all the way into the wee hours up to 4 a.m., then having to go to work by 8 a.m. at his full-time job. And as many of us know, his father just passed, and despite everything going on personally in his life, he gave his best. You know, I want to lift up our dear sister Malia, a single mom who blew out her missions. Like, it's just ridiculous. It's like... The goal, here's the goal that Malia had, and here's what she gave. Wow. It's just ridiculous. It's like, it's a laughing matter now. Like, oh my goodness. And then she seen the text message the other day, like, we may fall short at that time period. And she private messaged me like, bro, I'm willing to give more. I want to lift up our dear sister, Bernicia Clay, as well. <laughs> Another single mom just giving way above and above and beyond. I mean, this is who Southland is those who treasure is stored up in heaven and there's so many many of you guys as well who hit their goals and you should be commended by that however there are some who didn't just plan wisely whose treasure is not stored in heaven you know they had the mindset well i'm just not going to hit it like what are you jesus died on a cross what do you mean you're not going to hit it i'm just, I'm just not going to hit it it's a character issue there some did some did not even try. They didn't even like put two copper coins. Like, aren't we like inspired by the woman with the two copper coins? Like, oh my goodness, that was awesome. That was your opportunity to be like that woman, to find two nickels, pennies, a, a, a piece of dust, anything. But the fact that you came empty handed really shows where your heart is. Some waited last minute and just had poor planning. Amen. Do better next time. Some even with all the help that was given, and the opportunities of fundraising to help you meet your goal, you just stopped there. You rely so much on the help of other people, you didn't even take matters into your own hand because of laziness. 
in idleness. And it's not okay. This can be what Southland is. If we're really going to build this church and build it in a way where God is pleased with it, we have to be all in. It built treasures in heaven. Are you with me? You know, I just have a simple challenge on this. If you didn't give anything, you still have time to repent to give something. And if you did give everything, praise God. And if you're able to give more, if you're a guest and you're, you want to join in on that cause, join in. Because we really want to see God do incredible things, not here just in Southland, but on a greater aspect of the L.A. church and around the world. Are you with me? Yeah. You know, during this time as family, let's be family, let's be real family during the holidays. And not just get caught up in the holidays. You follow me? Instead, let's, let's truly be thankful to God by praising God. Let's truly be thankful to God by working hard for God. And let's truly be thankful to God by storing up our treasures and having family. I love you guys, and let's be thankful. Amen. A lot of tall people here. Amen.